us today. Pleasure to be here. I, um, I just had a few questions about your work um, to, to kind of share with the people that will be interacting with the Worcester Area Writers Database. Great. Um, my first question is, how, how did you get into the noir crime scene of creative writing? Um, I guess the short answer is accidentally. <laughs> I, um, I've actually, I think I've given different answers to that question when it's been asked over the years, and I think they're all true, you know, on some level. Um, I would say one answer is that um, I, uh, I grew up in Worcester. <laughs> and Worcester is, is, to some degree, Worcester is a uh, kind of a classic noir city, you know. Um, I have described in the past um, sort of crucial formative years during my teens when there was a um, uh, what we now call Grindhouse uh, Cinema downtown. Uh, we, we just called it an, an art cinema or a, a second show in cinema. It was called the Paris down on uh, Franklin Street. And uh, you could go down there on a Friday or Saturday night uh, and see two movies for a buck. And, but the movies were very often kind of classic uh, 1970s uh, kind of dark, downbeat crime narratives. And uh, so my buddies and I would, would uh, you know, we'd sort of uh, meet on the street corner and, and tramp the four miles downtown, and we'd watch, uh, you know, films like, uh, you know, uh, The Nickel Ride and uh, Dirty Harry and Prime Cut and uh, sort of these classic uh, tough guy. Uh, they're actually kind of neo-noir. They're they're, uh, they're an update on the original noir canon of the of the forties and fifties. Um, but what I've often said is, when the movies would get out, um, I would then walk back home. And uh, I, it, it occurred to me one night, I remember, sort of looking at, as I was walking back home, looking at um, these closed down factories and these seedy nightclubs and these burned out <laughs> neon signs. And it just, this looks a lot like what I just saw on the screen, you know? Right. So my, I, I sort of, uh, that mindset was uh, implanted a little bit at a, at a young age. Beyond that, I would say that um, it's sort of a happy uh, commercial accident in that I, I my, the first couple novels that I wrote that have never been published were not uh, noir novels. They were not crime novels. They were they had no mystery elements in them at all. Um, and then what happened is um, the, the third book that I wrote um, was based on uh, an anecdote that my, my wife um, gave me one night when we were out driving, and uh, I started to play with it a little bit, and it turned into, um, it, it turned out to have some noir elements, to have some crime elements, some hard-boiled elements to it. And I had, at that time, I was rereading um, some of the early uh, hard-boiled guys that I liked, uh, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, and the, everything just sort of came together. My memories of, of uh, the landscape of my teen years, uh, rereading some of those uh, great uh, 1930s and 40s hard-boiled writers and the particular story which I was working on. And then what happened, of course, is that was the book that sold. And so as tends to be the case, um, my agent and my editor and the publisher all came back and said, write another one like that. Right. So uh, that's what happened. Okay. So it, it was kind of a mixture of things. It wasn't It was. Yeah, there's no, there's no um, one definitive influence that sort of turned me down the noir alley. It was, it was a lot of different things from my, my formative years, uh, both in terms of my environment and my reading and my film going. And okay. Yeah. This question is actually more about wireless. Sure. Um, you, you seem to have done a great deal of, of kind of research and investigation into <laughs> the whole radio scene. Um, are, are you like a radio enthusiast on the side? Or are you, Not why, really. No. Why radios? You know, um, it's another happy accident. Um, I, most of my books, if not all of them, perhaps all of them, um, have all been given to me. I, I think of them all, the, the origin, the kernel, of each one of my novels uh, has been a little gift that someone close around me has given me. And as I said, my first book, Box Nine, was a story that my wife told me one night when we were sorry about what happened to her one night at the post office when she was working as a night sorter. Um, Wireless, my second book, I can tell you the exact moment of uh, origin of that book. Um, I have a, uh, a sibling, a brother, 
who is uh, a, an interesting guy, uh, something of a character, uh, very much a, um, a guy who is always into the next emerging subculture, uh, a bit of a, 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 he has a soul of an anarchist, I would say. Okay. And he, um, uh, one day I was, uh, I, I was walking out of my office and I was about to get into my car and I heard a great uh, loud rumbling noise and my brother came screeching around the corner in, in like a 1965, uh, you know, Cadillac convertible or something. Just, it's just some god-awful dinosaur of a car that was spewing smoke, you know, on its last legs. And he pulled up in front of me and literally what happened was he tossed a uh, tape, a cassette tape in the air to me and said, give this a listen. And then he vanished back into the, okay. the subculture. And, uh, and that, you know, as a writer, something like that will pique your curiosity. Right. <laughs> so I jumped in my car and I, I popped the tape in. And what it was was a, um, it was a, a tape of, it was a bootleg tape of um, what at the time, this was probably in the, the mid-1980s, I guess, uh, a, a little fad that emerged um, that was called jamming. Uh, uh, these characters called themselves jammers, and they... They were anarchists, uh, in, in uh, sort of cultural anarchists. Right. And what they did was um, they didn't like the idea that um, any governing body could uh, uh, carve up and license the airwaves. So the FCC. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So what these guys did in the, uh, the late 70s and early 80s, I guess, was they would, they would uh, you know, uh, raid Radio Shack and get themselves some equipment. And, and they took delight in... Um, they would set up shop somewhere and they would bump uh, licensed uh, official stations off the air and with their often nonsensical or uh, profane <laughs> broadcasts. And I, I was completely unaware of it. It was the first that I had uh, heard of the sort of pirate radio movement. Right. And uh, again, within about five minutes of hearing this bootleg tape, uh, the germ of a story began to sort of percolate in my brain a little bit, okay. and uh, within weeks I said, oh, I'm going to get a novel out of this, I think. Yours is proof that I would say that the romantic and unsettling um, view of organized crime still exists. <laughs> um, what, what is your inspiration for, you know, Buzz Coat, um, Frankie Loftus, all, yeah. all, all the, the, the Gray Roaches and the Herman Kinsky? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of gangs in the books. Uh, and I think that uh, again, I don't know that there's one answer to that. Um, I guess one thing that I would say to you was, you know, uh, I, I am a uh, American male of a certain age, and which uh, inherently means that uh, you know I grew up a uh, Godfather fanatic. <laughs> you know, can, can, like every peer that I had, you know, you find a 50 year old guy, they can quote the movie uh, dialogue to you verbatim. Um, so there was that always that sense of you know uh, growing up, um, that sense of, of a pop narrative that tried to talk about American power structures using sort of pulp material. Okay. I think that had something of an influence on me. Beyond that, I would say that um, part of the noir tradition, um, you know, I, I often think that the credo of noir is. Uh, I first came across this. Um, uh, great noir writer, uh, Jim Thompson, of the, of the 1950s, uh, the guy who wrote The Killer Inside Me and The Getaway and uh, Savage Night. Um, he, he said, uh, there's only one real story plot, and that is, uh, nothing is as it appears. And I think you can take that as, as, a, uh, as sort of the credo of what the noir story is all about, um, to some degree. Uh, and, and so it, it seemed to me, as I was writing, I, I wanted to write from the beginning, even before I had a name for it, I wanted to write about a uh, decaying, rust belt American metropolis. Um, uh, because I, it, it seemed like um, a great metaphor for what, uh, for a lot of different things, actually. But it was also sort of, it resonated with the world in which I came of age. Um, sort of that um, somewhat cynical uh, post '60s uh, Vietnam Watergate. Uh, nothing is what it appears to be, right. 
And in, in constructing that um, city, uh, which I came to call Quinsigamond, it occurred to me that um, you know, if if uh, nothing is as it appears to be, is the Credo of Noir, it is the uh, constitution of the city of Quinsigamond. Uh, and, and, and so uh, Quinsigamond, uh, though apparently run, you know, by a, a, a egomaniacal mayor and a, a craven city council of some sort, uh, the actual power structure of the city are these um, sort of ethnic gangs that operate in very uh, much a tribal fashion. And um, I've had a, just a ball building different, you know, I divided the city up, you know, into, into right. different uh, ethnic conclaves, and then I gave each, uh, the, the individual who runs each one is called the neighborhood mayor mm -hmm. um, in the books, and uh, each one has some sort of a, an army of street muscle or, or a gang that, that uh, of button men that, that sort of uh, facilitate his, his desires and, and needs. Right. So I guess that's where it came from. Okay. How are you able to make them so real? <laughs> well, thank you. This, this <laughs> I guess that's a matter of opinion, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, that's just a... I guess I want to say that... Uh, I, I think there, there is a reader who that, it does surprise them when, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a middle-class, you know, schmuck like myself can create sort of these very cold-blooded, uh, sociopathic characters. Um, and my answer to that is always, um, that's, that's my job. You know, that's sort of, uh, that's what you do when you're a writer. I, I always remember how instructive it was when um, my first book came out and uh, I, I was doing a local signing and a, uh, a guy I hadn't seen for a long time, uh, an old pal, uh, sort of came through. He had read the book already. And he came through the line and he said, hey, I gotta ask you, you know, growing up, I had no idea, when did you become such a gun fanatic? You know, there's all this stuff about guns and you know, the books. And I said, I, I don't know anything about guns, you know, I don't, I don't own a gun, I don't. And he said, but there's all this stuff. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I went to the Worcester Public Library for an hour and took notes. That's what okay. we do, you know, that's what, the, the uh, as I've said to, to writing students uh, in the past, you know, your job is, you, you don't need to know everything in the world. You just have to convince the reader that you do. You know, right. your, your job is to create that sense of versatility. You, you, uh, and uh, the, other, the other thing I would say about that is that I am a, uh, I mean, I like research. I'm, I'm sort of a, you know, I enjoy wandering in a library and letting one book lead me to another book to another book. So it's just, it's a function of the job, you know? Okay. Because, I, I mean, just looking at some of those gangs, I, I can just literally, I mean, it's, it's one thing to read something, but having it actually make an image in your, in your brain, it just, I don't know. Well, the, the other thing that I can say, speak to about that is that, I, I can't speak for any other writers, I guess. I, the way that I operate is uh, pretty instinctually. Um, my gut determines a lot of uh, choices that I make. So that what will often happen will be, um, if, if I'm constructing either a, uh, you know, I'm working on, I'm pulling together a character or a gang, as you say, you know, I will, I will read, um, well, in wireless, for instance, I'll give you a, a, an example. Um, I remember reading several books about uh, the Khmer Rouge and the atrocities in uh, Cambodia in the 70s. And, um, and, and I remember, you know, you don't know what you're going to need. So you sort of wade into uh, lots of research material, and then your gut recognizes it when you see something. I remember reading some book on, uh, on Cambodia and coming to a, a, a detail where uh, Khmer Rouge used to, um, you know, they were big on, uh, one, one way of uh, eliminating their enemies was to douse them in benzene, right? and boom. So, and that's the kind of thing, you read that paragraph and you go, oh, well, there's going to be a scene in the book where that happens, you know, right. obviously. Um, but I've read, you know, I, when I was doing um, uh, 
research on my, my latest book, The Resurrectionist, I read books about motorcycle gangs and Hell's Angels. Now, the, the gang that I create, the Abominations, they're very, uh, they're over the top. It's, it's uh, very much the book is, uh, to some degree, phantasmagorical. So I, I let myself take as many liberties as I want. As long as I have sort of what, what I'm striving for is this underpinning of uh, specific uh, specifically chosen details that sort of give you this foundation that once you have it in place, then you can do all kinds of crazy things. One of the, one of the most evident aspects of your work is um, your use of kind of real, real life places mm -hmm. once in a while. Yeah. Um, how do you develop such a strong ability to, to kind of take those places and make them your own in this living city? Yeah. Um, I would say the majority of... Uh, the settings in the books, not all of them, but but probably a majority of them have um, what I would call uh, real world analogs, and right. those analogs are usually right here. We'll stick. Uh, and where that that came out of was, um, you know, a, a couple things. One thing is that as a reader, you know, you're a reader before you're a writer, mm -hmm. and the kind of reader you are tends to determine, I think. The kind of writer that you grow into. Um, I always very much um, loved a specific sense of place in in books, and I'm I'm very clear that um, there are a lot of readers out there that don't. You know, I I remember uh, I, I like I enjoy as a reader, you know, narrative description. Um, I remember after one my first or second book came out, my my college roommate calling me up and saying, "Oh." All the description in your books—it's like having to read Thomas Hardy again. And I said, "Well, thank you. That's you know, <laughs> I, I liked Hardy." Uh, my um, what I tend to do is when, when I'm uh, part, part of it comes out of uh, you know my my childhood and my teen years. Again, I keep I keep going back to these formative years, but they have determined so much in terms of the writing in the books. Um, you know, I come from a, I think, a long line of drivers, you know. Uh, my father, uh, you know, was most content, I think, when he was behind the wheel of his car. And I was most often his co-pilot, you know. So, uh, you know, from from a very young age, you know, uh, I spent lots of time just winding aimlessly around the uh, nonsensical streets of Worcester, you know. Oh, <laughs> it's not exactly a, a nicely gridded out city. Um, and uh, and the city seemed, because of that, I think, because I was with my father and because of the nature of my own imagination, you know, I found the city from, from a very young age. I found it uh, terrifically interesting and intriguing and, and a little bit haunting. And, uh, um, and that was the antithesis of the experience that all my, my friends had. You know, I've often said... Um, you know, I, I have vivid memories of, uh, you know, hanging around the neighborhood corner with my buddies as a teenager in high school, and everybody just, the, 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 uh, the one topic of conversation that would keep coming back would be, uh, boy, I can't wait to get out of the city as soon as I get myself together, you know, I'm getting out of the city. And I, I would always kind of hang back a little bit because I, I felt like a Judas, because to me, I understood what they were saying, mm -hmm. but I, I saw the city with a different set of eyes. So when I started um, writing the books, uh, I, I knew from the beginning that uh, Quinn Sigmund was going to be my uh, territory, you know, that, that Quinn Sigmund was going to be my sort of mythical landscape for uh, pr probably for the, you know, the, the bulk of my work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I started doing was, uh, in the early years, even when I was writing short stories before I was uh, working on novels, you know, I would, I'd outline, and when I would, um, you know, work up a chapter, figure out what was going to happen in a, in a particular chapter, I'd sort of go to work on where was this going to take place. And then I would, uh, I mean, I've gone so far, I've said in the past, uh, if, I, if I thought of some place in the city that would serve as a, uh, as the foundation for a setting, you know, I would... Um, you know, I'd latch on to it like, uh, like crazy. I, I, uh, I remember in the early days, my, my wife and I would, would go out and 
sort of scout locations like a, like a movie uh, scout would do, and, and she'd take photographs, you know? And, and while I'd be working on that chapter, I'd have, you know, enlargements of the, the photos of a building that she'd taken up. Um, I, I've often said, you know, there are a lot of diners in my, uh, in my books because I love diners and because um, there are a lot of diners in Worcester. And, and if I had picked a particular uh, diner to base uh, a scene or a chapter or a setting on, um, you know, I'd eat breakfast and lunch every day for three weeks, you know, until the chapter was done, you know. I would count the number of coffee mugs on the shelf just to... But then, the, the thing is... Um, so often, I find that local readers uh, will either recognize some aspect of a certain setting as originating in a Worcester locale, or have heard from somebody, oh, that diner in Chapter 6 is based on this diner. Mm -hmm. And there's often a uh, disconnect, because I, I had an experience where uh, I was doing a reading, and I, I mentioned in passing that... Um, the diner in the chapter was based on the uh, Miss Worcester Diner down on Southbridge Street. Um, and afterward, a uh, uh, man came up to me and said, um, yeah, you said you based that on the Miss Worcester Diner. I, I said, I did. And he said, but you, the owners in your book are, uh, you know, Cambodian. And I know the owners of that diner. I, <laughs> you know, it's fiction. I, right. I change things. Um, and often I change them wildly. You know, I... Um, as I think I mentioned to you at one point, the origin of the uh, nightclub in uh, Box 9, I think it was, uh, was the uh, old Aurora Hotel mm -hmm. rooming house down on Main Street. Now, if you read the description of the nightclub and you stand outside on Main <laughs> Street and look at the Aurora, you might have some trouble, right. you know, seeing how one got to be the other. But I often say, you know, I, I start with a foundation and then I just let my imagination sort of run roughshod over it. Okay. Kind of going along with the, um, the, the idea of locations in the city, do you, do you feel that, I mean, because I looked back at your description and I looked at some of the places that you said <laughs> were the parallels, right. and um, I realized that some of them have actually been redone. And oh, yeah. Remodeled, yeah, exactly. Like, um, like Union Station. Oh, that best example. I, uh, I often joke that, you know, I don't mean this, obviously, uh, but I have said that I'm the only guy in the city who was just uh, heartbroken when they renovated <laughs> Union Station because you know, that was my bread and butter. I said so okay. many things in there. Um, and Union Station had a, uh, you know, that, that comes from a personal, that, that building and that location has a lot of uh, resonance mm -hmm. for me uh, because for a year I went to, my, my grammar school closed uh, in 72, at the end of 70, uh, spring of 72, and for my final year of, uh, for eighth grade, my final year of grammar school, um, I, I went to a, uh, a school down on Temple Street, um, across from the uh, St. John's Church, the, the oldest church in the city. Okay. And um, to get the bus home, um, I found uh, you, one could shortcut through the old Union Station. And I remember the first day I walked in there, I, oh, I've never forgotten it. it. Obviously, as you can see by the repeated instances of uh, the setting in the books, right. it, made a, it made a big impression. But it was, it was right around that same time, in the early 70s, you know, there were an awful lot of sort of post-apocalyptic uh, dystopian uh, movies out there, fables, you know, right. uh, you know uh, Boy and His Dog and, uh, you know, Zardoz and... Uh, I can't. I can't even think of them all now. But some of the post bomb, you know, ruined city movies. Right. And I remember the first day I ever walked through uh, the old Union Station pre-renovation. I just went. I wandered into one of those movies. You know. Right. The other thing I remember about that is that um, uh, several months later, uh, mentioning um, my practice of cutting through there in the presence of my uh, uncle, who was a uh, uh, police officer, you know, for 40 years, and he went crazy, you know, he said, what are you doing, Walker? <laughs> Smack me in the head. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, um, you know, I have above my desk, I have a, uh, a photograph, a uh, really gorgeous photograph that a uh, local, uh, I, don't, I don't think he's local anymore, but a photographer at the time who was uh, 
he was the architectural photographer for the renovation project, or okay. one of them. And he, uh, he, he knew my connection to Union Station and sent me a photo that is so striking. It's just, uh, it's amazing. The, the, the moon is sort of shining, moonlight is shining through a crack in the ceiling, illuminating just this devastation below. You know, okay. it, it looks like the photo and my memories of, of Union Station in the early 70s, you know, it looks like what I imagine uh, Dresden looked like after the fire bombing, you know, during World War II. Right. Uh, just this, this absolute uh, decay and chaos and ruin, you know, just, and so uh, because of that, because of the strength of that memory and the vividness of that memory, um, it became an, just a sort of, a, as soon as I started writing the novels, I knew, oh, this, things are going to happen in okay. Union Station, or my, my bounce on Union Station. Is that, is that photo where the inspiration, um, the scene where, where Sylvia in, yeah, is that the, well, what I'll say is that, uh, you know, as I was working on that book, I know that I would <laughs> repeatedly okay. glance up for, for just to get the feel, you know, that sort of gritty. Okay. Yeah, because when you started mentioning that immediately, like, something went off. There you go. Yeah. I'm kind of hesitant to go down there, you know, I don't want to lose right. my, I want to keep it in my head in, in that sort of post-apocalyptic uh, condition. Right, because I remember reading your books and just basing off of the Union Station that I pulled in front of, because I, I, just coming to the city from New York, I hadn't realized exactly when it was renovated. <laughs> so, re kind of reading the book and then looking at Union Station, I said, well, what happened in between here? Yeah, and it was, you know, it was, it, it, anyone my age in the city would remember it most vividly in that just devastated condition. It was that, it was that way for an awful long time. Right. Uh, and it was, you know, they were, it, it's an amazing place. I had the opportunity to wander through there, uh, you know, as an adult, uh, uh, more, <laughs> more under safer conditions. Uh, and it really was a, you know, um, obviously in the book I've made it as haunting as I possibly can and as, uh, you know, eerie and as uh, dangerous, I guess. But when I walked, when I sort of toured the place, just, you know, probably months before the renovation took place, um, it was genuinely eerie. You know, it was, it was uh, real life eerie. It was, it, it, there was evidence that people lived in there at different times, and there was some, there were communities, uh, you know, engaged in transactions inside, gotcha. inside that place. So, yeah, it was, it was quite a place. Okay. Uh, how I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna stop it. So, one of the things I know many writers have different kind of ways of going about finding a story. Um, how 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 do you do it? Do you have a specific process? <laughs> does it just come on a lark? How does? I have never, um, for whatever reason, you know, I've never. Uh, I've always had the opposite problem. You know, I've, I'm bombarded by too many story ideas. You know, okay. every day I can't, you know, I can't drive to the store to pick up a gallon of milk without getting four story ideas, you know, it's just sort of the way my brain is wired. Um, you know, 99% of those die on the vine. Uh, I am a big, uh, I'm sort of an obsessive uh, cultivator of my own notebook. You know, I've, I've kept notebooks since I was, you know, seven or eight years old. And I, I today I think of it as just the, the notebook, capital T, capital letters, this one sort of chaotic and sprawling uh, data bank. Right. Um, and what I'll do is, you know, uh, if a, on any given day, if a particular story notion um, occurs to me, I, I almost always have a notebook with me. I'll carry a small notebook on my person. There'll be a notebook in my car. There'll be a notebook, you know, next to my reading chair at home. Um, sometimes there'll be a, you know, I'll have a micro recorder with me sometimes if I'm, if I'm driving and can't write. Um, and I'll, I'll try to make some sort of a, an abbreviated note just to sort of pin down so I don't, especially as my, as my memory continues to erode, uh, so that I can just pin it down. And as I say, uh, so my notebooks are full, you know, I've got 10,000 notebook pages filled with, you know, ideas that never, you know, came to fruition, that never gestated at all. Um, and, and... Then every now and then there'll be one idea that is just, you know, uh, it wants to be enfleshed in language. It pushes me 
uh, it stays with me and is tenacious and, and sort of, uh, you know, won't leave me alone. And that's when I know, yeah, that one will probably uh, develop into a book. What I sometimes find, excuse me, I, um, years ago I read a, an interview where Stephen King was asked either that question or a similar question about the origin of story ideas. And he said something that just struck so uh, true to me. This is very often the case. This was the case, a story idea I had last week that just has really hit me hard. Um, he said often it's when two disparate ideas suddenly come together in a way he didn't anticipate. You know, They might be ideas for two different stories right? You know, that would seem to have no connection whatsoever. Uh, they're not tied together by theme. They're not tied together by setting. They're not tied together by genre. They're not tied together by, you know, the whatever the author's intent is. And suddenly, there's this epiphanous moment where they just merge, and they complete one another. And you go, "Wow!" This, you know, all the circuits, the circuit lights up completely. You know, and you just kind of, and when that happens, that's just delightful. You know, you sort of, I think the writer lives for those moments. You know, and it's it's this great eureka moment where you just go, "Oh my God." That would be sweet. That would that. It's it's a very much an instinctual thing. It's very much you just. It's a feeling. You know. It's it's. Uh, you just hear the internal bell go off. And go, oh, okay, great, right. We got something nice there. Okay. So we kind of talked about um, the process of kind of getting ideas for a story. This question is more about your characters. Um, yep. Their personalities tend to run the gamut. You have everybody from yep. from Sweeney and the Resurrectionist to Sylvia in yep. the Skin Palace. Um, do you have any process for creating a personality? Um, you know, I to me, um, I guess I would say that personality, you know, character personality or character, uh, the essence of a character is revealed to me, uh, I think, I guess I'd say in voice. You know, I, I sort of, I know that I, I know that I either have the character or that I want to pursue the character when um, I can sort of hear the sound of their head in my own head, if that makes any sense at all. Um, you know, I don't, I, I have sometimes in the past, I'm, I'm not big on, uh, less so than with settings where I do draw from sort of real world models. Mm -hmm. I tend, I will steal characteristic, kind of trivial characteristic traits. Um, well, sometimes I think uh, mannerisms or, or speaking style, I've done that in the past and sort of tried to apply it to a character. But it has more to do with sort of understanding the character from inside out, uh, meaning, I guess, um, you know what? What is what does this person desire? What do they need? And what is it about not only the environment in which they dwell, but about themselves that is preventing you know that, that is creating the conflict that is the essence of your story? You know, uh, I mean, Sweeney, for instance, uh, is kind of an interesting example to me because. Uh, you know, he's, he's sort of classically, in some ways, the guy who gets in his own way. And, and I've heard comments about that he's, uh, he's not a real likable character in, in some ways. Uh, I think he frustrated a lot of people. The other comment I've heard that I think is interesting is that, and it sounds disingenuous when I say this, I, I know, I'm aware of that, uh, but people close around me have said, yeah, there's a lot of you in Sweden. <laughs> Which makes me laugh even harder when I hear people say, he's a really unpleasant character. Um, yeah, characters are just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting process in that um, I, don't th I don't know that there's any cut and dry way of, I, I would have more difficulty, I think, trying to instruct somebody in character creation than anything else, you know. I, I can sit down and have you know, in the past uh, with students, uh, I can talk about plot until I'm blue in the face, you know. I mean, that's very mechanical to me. It's very, almost maybe too mechanical in, in some instances. And I can talk about uh, construction of setting, mm -hmm. you know. 
And I can even talk about uh, thematic concerns and, and how and why they would originate in uh, you know, the, the writer's psyche. Uh, but character is, is uh, I guess it, it's somewhat organic. You know, it's, it's very much a, uh, I, I don't know that I can be more, it isn't very clear, but I don't know, the, 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 the thing that sounds the most correct and appropriate to me at this moment is that, you know what, I, I know that I have a character that interests me when I am sort of hearing that character's voice in my head. And when I say voice, I don't, I don't just mean dialogue. I mean sort of the interior monologue of that, right. of that character as well. Okay. This, this is kind of more of a, not necessarily a personal question, but it, it, one of my own personal curiosities about um, one of the things that you incorporated in The Skin Palace and Word Made Flesh, The Floating Kitchen. Yeah. Where, where, where did that come from? Was That's that... going back a ways. Um, that is not, I don't believe that that is, um, you know, the concept, I think, is just a, a notebook idea. You know? Okay. I think I, I was probably sitting at a red light somewhere and said, well, you know, sort of a restaurant that moved around, you know. And then, of course, the bounce on, you know, having ways movable feast, you know, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole notion of that. I, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> it's been so long since I reread uh, that book. Um, I think my my real world model for where it, uh, it's set. I think with, with, with the Skin Palace we're talking about, isn't yes. it? And uh, I think I, I use Bancroft Tower. Yes, uh, as as the inspiration for that, because again, from that same era, you know, just, just as I've mentioned, uh, the Paris Cinema and. Union Station, Bancroft Tower was definitely a uh, sort of a hangout spot when when I was a kid. You know, right. that, was, that was sort of a place we'd congregate and, and uh, get into some trouble. And, <laughs> okay, I was just wondering because the nuisance of ourselves, the, the concept of there being just a, a restaurant up there, uh, just. <laughs> Would you eat me. there? Well, I actually have eaten there, not, not from a restaurant, but that's that's why I said, you know, there hey, you that's another person picking up on that. But um, that was, you know, just a personal curiosity, that's all. Okay. This, in Word Made Flesh, there was the, the secondary storyline of the July Suite and right. the Schiller. Yeah. Um, and how it goes on to later kind of come out that that was chronicled in a book where the cover was actually made of human flesh. Right. Um, is there kind of like a hidden statement about the power of the literature? Probably. Um, you know, that that is that is sort of interesting in that Word Made Flesh, you know, I, it's tough to differentiate between any of your books uh, in terms of your attachment to them. Uh, but if I were pressed, you know, if you put a gun to my head right now, I, I would likely say Word Made Flesh is my favorite of my books. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that it, the intention when I began that book was um, to write something very commercial very quickly. Uh, in fact, I mean, to digress just for a moment, it, just because I get a kick out of the story, um, you know, I, I, uh, I had finished um, The Skin Palace, and my agent was looking for my next book, and right at the time that I had the idea, the, w what I thought was going to be the idea for, for uh, Word Made Flesh, uh, I discovered, my, my wife and I discovered she was pregnant. And so uh, I, I sort of grabbed a calendar, and I, knowing that once I had two young children in the house, my writing time was going to be uh, minimal at best, uh, I plotted out, you know, for, from that moment until uh, my wife's due date, uh, how many days I had, and then how many pages I needed to write each day to complete a manuscript. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as, you know, uh, as fate would have it, uh, my son was born 10 days early, and I had one <laughs> chapter left to finish. Now, the beautiful thing about that is, uh, and, and this is instructive to some degree to, to writers, I think, young writers, um, I couldn't write another word for probably six to nine months before I sort of got my equilibrium back and got some time back began to sleep again. And um, in that six to nine months, 
what I had imagined to be, what I had hoped to be, a very commercial, uh, mechanical, uh, plot-driven bullet of a book uh, changed utterly. You know, other uh, layering sort of and influences began to exert pressure on it, and it turned into a completely, you know, that, that subplot sort of became very important and elaborate and, and complex uh, to some degree. Um, where the, you know, was, it, this is one of those, uh, this is another, another aspect of that is, again, to refer to the notebook. Um, what I recall is um, I'm, I'm big on sort of collecting titles, you know. If a good title occurs to me, even if I don't have an idea to attach to it, Mm -hmm. You know, I'll just write down. And I, and I had, for years, I had written down one day in the, note, in the notebook um, a title that was Manuscript Bound in Human Skin. And I think I had read, I think that came from there, I, I could have this completely wrong, but I, I think there is a collection of such volumes at the Harvard Library. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I read an article and said, oh, you know. And... When it came time, when, during that sort of fallow period where I was not writing, when I still had one chapter left to finish Word May Flesh, I sort of kept dwelling on, on the meaning of you know, what does it mean if a, you know, to, to bind a, a manuscript, a story, a narrative inside human skin. What does that mean? What are the suggestions that arise out of that concept? And uh, you know, much brooding and rumination uh, by a sleep-deprived brain later, <laughs> It ended up in the, you know, the book took a very different form, and it ended up a different story than the, the story that we have now. Okay. So, like we said before, I mean, a lot of people have kind of classified your works into the noir crime kind, yeah. of, kind of category. Um, but I, I see, or I saw rather, that a, lo a lot of your earlier works had kind of a cop and robber kind of feel. Yeah. Kind of an, an authority figure of the law, with right? interacting with the city. Um, in the Resurrectionist, it, it, it kind of felt different, and I was wondering, kind of like, what what brought on the change? Um, I I would say, I guess, just natural evolution of where I'm sort of just chasing my own tail a lot mm -hmm. of the time, um, and I, you know, um, I love the noir stuff. I've read tons of it over the last twenty years or so, especially that sort of American mid-century paperback writer, you know. 60,000 word lion book, you know, gold medal book, J Jim Thompson, David Gudis, Gil Brewer. I love those guys. Um, and I played with a lot of those devices and a lot of those conventions through the earlier books. Um, but I think what, what has happened is I, uh, I am allowing myself at this point, um, you know, foolishly or otherwise, to simply follow. Uh, the stories kind of where they want to go, uh, in the city where it's going. Uh, again, I never. It was it was something of an, an accident the way the early books were, um, you know, constructed and marketed. In that, you know, and an example I can give you is I had contracted um, for uh, two books after after Box Nine and. Uh, Wireless came out, and I was working at the time that Wireless was published. I was working on the Skin Palace, mm -hmm. and I turned in a few months after Wireless was published. I turned in uh, the first draft of uh, the Skin Palace to my agent, and what I recall is him calling me up pretty soon after he received it, and he said, um, "You know, it's a, it's an interesting book, but you signed a contract for sort of this law crime." mystery, hard-boiled book, and there are no criminals in this, there are no <laughs> cops in this, there are no gangsters, there are no, uh, you know, you're sort of laughing a little bit, and what happened is, you know, I, uh, the entire, if you've read Skin Pals, that entire secondary story of the Kinski family, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jacob. Herman Kinski and his, his son Jacob and his cousin, uh, that was all layered in afterwards. You know, okay. the, the book originally was just about you know, uh, Sylvia, about this, this young woman uh, who's sort of in the midst of uh, metamorphosis, and she, she finds an old camera that has some uh, 
various images on it, and I sort of just chased that. And it was much more of a, uh, the first draft was much more of sort of played with gothic conventions, much more than uh, noir or had boiled, though there was some, probably some connection between them. Uh, at this point, you know, all bets are off. I don't really know, I mean, the state of publishing is insane right now anyway. Uh, and I'm just, I mean, you sort of have to keep the original reasons why you started doing this curious activity in the first place um, in the forefront of your heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I often say, you know, the books are just the, the end product of this very quirky pre-dawn hobby that I have, you know, this very strange activity that kind of just gives me a particular kind of joy and meaning. Um, and since that's the case, uh, I'm really beholden to just you know, sort of tramping along after whatever story captivates me. Okay. So, okay. I mean, what, what I would say is that uh, looking forward, uh, I, I continue to, I believe that my stories will continue to be set in Quinn Sigmund. Mm -hmm. And the nature of Quinn Sigmund is that it is a, a sort of a, a noir machine. Right. So, to that extent, there will always be these noir elements in it. But, you know, to give you an example, I, I wrote a novel that we, I never even took to market uh, after uh, Word Made Flesh that had no noir or prime uh, or hard-boiled elements to it whatsoever. You know, it was kind of mm -hmm. a satirical road novel you know, okay. that sort of originated in Quinsigamon and ended in Quinsigamon. And it, it was uh, completely out of character. And, and we never, you know, my agent, we had a conversation when it was done. You know, I spent a year and a half for about four hundred page draft, and he said, "Yeah, it's an interesting book, but uh, you know, it will only serve to confuse whatever readership you have managed to build over the course of five books." Right. They'll they'll say, "Why does it have Jack O'Connell's name on it? It's not a Jack O'Connell." <laughs> so, I'm just going to chase story. You know, I'm okay. going to chase whatever stories are, you know, appeal to me or that or, or that. I guess the better way to say it is the stories that I feel compelled to uh, to tell. One of the recurring themes that I saw, it's it's not exactly a large one, or, or it, it is actually in, in The Resurrectionist, but only once or twice in some of the others. Jehenna. Yeah. Um, what, what, what was kind of your aim with Jehenna? Well, uh, you know, I, I guess... <laughs> I come out of a, I come out of a real, uh, I mean, I don't think I was aware of this until I was an adult, but I come out of a, a fairly uh, full-blooded, let's say, uh, Catholic background, you know. I, I, you know, I attended Catholic schools for uh, 17 years, and, and, you know, at a time when it was, uh, you know, I, I, I still had big, Scary nuns and black habits, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and there was very much a uh, and, you know, often often Irish nuns, uh, and I think there was a big that had an impact. That very fact had an impact on my on the development of my imagination, so that uh, there is a um, there's sort of a biblical component to some of the themes that repeatedly and continually, you know, obsess me. Uh, and that, that whole, the, the whole sort of basic Catholic cosmology of, uh, you know, light versus dark, you know, good versus evil, either or, one, zero, you know, the whole, the whole, that whole sort of binary, oppositional binary dialectic, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder if that's what sort of determine the nature of the uh, <laughs> particular psychosis that we might call my <laughs> work so far. Um, and that's just, that's where Gehenna comes from. It's just a, it's just a you know, uh, it, it's just another reference to um, the dark aspect of reality, let's okay. say, I guess. Right. So th this is more of a, a general question about, you know, 
maybe somebody looking to, to get into the, the creative writing or pro professional field. Um, do, do you have any advice for someone that's kind of <laughs> breaking to be or looking to break into the life of an established writer? You know, um, all bets are off. I think right now. I don't. I, you know, I'm I'm not a pessimist. I, I have said repeatedly. Uh, I I continue to think that as long as we. Uh, you know, define ourselves as human. We're going to need story. We're going to need narrative. It's you know, we we've needed it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The the problem is that uh, the the structures and the uh, the media that conveys that narrative is changing so rapidly. Right. And you can either I mean there there's two ways to sort of think about it. As far as <laughs> once again that dia that binary dialectic coming into play, uh, you know, you can either say as I know some writers who do feel this way, you know. Eh, I'm going to go down with the ship, you know. I'm going to still write the way I always wrote. I'm going to still write, you know, prose narrative. I'm still going to write novels, you know, until the day they, they don't make novels anymore. Um, or you can say, what what's on the horizon? What can I look at and embrace? And I, I'm a bit of a pendulum, you know. I feel like I'm, I was born on the fault line between the print age and, and the digital age. And... Um, and it's funny too because I I, I find I'm pretty easily influenced. I, I will I'll sit down and, and uh, have have uh, you know lunch with with older writers I know you know and it's it's just the apocalypse you know they just, oh, that's the end of the world you know drink up mates and then I'll have you know lunch with with uh, younger writers I know you know there's a guy in his 30s who's just you know I've been working with him on he's been working on his first novel for, for 10 years, you know. And he uh, is very comfortable with the, the rapidity and the uh, essence of the digital, you know, revolution that's that's happened and how it impacts narrative, you know. And uh, he's all excited about, uh, you know, uh, the whole new, the brave new world of transmedia, you know, of telling large, you know, epic stories uh, across a variety of medium. So it almost... Uh, depends on what day you ask me, <laughs> what kind of a response you're going to get. I, I, you know, in, in terms of advice to anyone, I, I don't have pragmatic advice because that wasn't my experience. You know, uh, it, you know, if you have, uh, I have always had the sense that, based on my own experience, you sort of become a writer because you don't have any choice. <laughs> You know, you are compelled to do this. You know, come hell or high water, and you, and you, uh, and you find a way to do it. You know, you find a way to, to satisfy that need. Um, you know, I, I remember the, the great. I think it was. I'll, I'll attribute it to uh, Don Westlake, uh, who died a few years ago. Great, prolific uh, novelist, and uh, he said something about you know he, he when, when he was trying to become a professional writer, you know, earn, earn his keep through writing, you know, he refused to have a, uh, you know, everyone around him, his very pragmatic family would say, well, just, you know, have a backup plan, have a backup plan. And he said, I refuse to have a backup plan because let me tell you, you will use your backup plan. And that's the nature, that's the one thing you need to know about the writing life. If you have a backup plan, you'll eventually utilize yeah. it because it's, it's, you know, it's a tough haul. But it's always been a tough haul, you know. If you, I, I love the literary biography. I read a lot of it. You know, it was, you know, read Melville's life story. That's, that's instructive. <laughs> you know, you'll have, you, you, his Melville, you know, utterly uh, ignored, thought insane, you know, and, and reduced for the last twenty years of his working life to, you know, working in the customs house. You know, uh, you know, people thought he was dead. Ten years before he died, you know that that, that sort of. <laughs> I think to me that's the that's the paradigm for the American writer's life. <laughs> so I had no illusions sort of going in, you know. That's always to me. It's always you know when I publish a book, it's always another miracle, you know. Oh, wonderful, incredible, it happened again. <laughs> in past interviews, because I'll admit that I looked those up, um, you mentioned surfistas and kind of modern street gangs as. Possibilities for yeah future works. I mean, what are there any hints for what's coming up? Um, <laughs> I wish I could give you some hints. I, I um, I've tried twice uh, ten years ago 
uh, and the last two years to take a crack at this idea I have for the uh, what we'll call the Surfista novel. That, that, yeah, that's based on uh, a, a uh, article I read years ago, you know, back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. about um, some street kids down in, it began I think down in Rio, uh, down in Brazil, uh, who um, were not allowed onto um, the beaches uh, where they would, you know, they'd stay on the outskirts and, and uh, watch the, the surfer, the tourist surfers, you know, surf the, the waves at Rio. Uh, but these urchins were not allowed mm -hmm. sort of on the beach. In fact, there were, and I, I used some of this material, there were, uh, there's a couple of good books about it, that, that were death squads, you know, the, the merchants by the resort areas were hiring, uh, you know, local police to actually kill these homeless kids because they didn't want the tourists bothered. Uh, but what the kids did, because they couldn't really surf, they, they started surfing on the tops of commuter trains, you know, going 100 miles an hour. Uh, and a whole, the thing that intrigued me about that was an entire um, community evolved out of this fad. And it was terrifically dangerous. There was, a, there was kids would get killed. Uh, there was a hierarchy based on how many injuries you had, how many burns, and how many broken bones. Uh, they developed even a vocabulary. You know, they had, they had names they would call each other. And, uh, and uh, that was one of those instances, uh, you know, probably 18 years ago or so, where I, I read something and it, sort of in an instant I knew, oh, I, I got a story there. But unfortunately, you know, I have take, taken two, uh, and this is instructive, I guess, it's, I've taken two hard runs at it, you know, um, and accumulated pages in both instances, but as I say, about uh, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, I gave it a try and, and, you know, went off track, so to speak, <laughs> give the pun. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the last two years, I tried again, and I could not, the book just sort of dissolved in my hands. So I do, I do hope that, um, it's a book I hope to write one of these days, and I hope that, uh, you know, a moment arrives where I, I sort of figure out how to construct that book and, and bring it to fruition. Uh, just recently, I just started uh, something new. Uh, I don't know where it's going <laughs> right now. I don't, uh, I, but I'm just chasing it. You know, I'm just chasing it down. I, I uh, it's something completely different for me that I have never uh, sort of a very different kind of story for me. Uh, deeply personal, uh, and it's the kind of thing. In fact, it's so. Uh, it's probably the most personal thing I've ever attempted to write, to the point where I'm not even sure it's something I would ever take to market. You know, I, 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 I want to chase it to completion, but uh, I don't know if it's a story I'll share ever. You know, right. maybe, it may be one for the desk drawer. You know, we'll, we'll find out. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, there's there's there are uh, dozens of of stories uh, sitting in my story notions, as I call them, sitting in my file cabinets. But my hope is, you know, if my, my health holds out and my, you know, uh, abilities uh, hold on for a little while longer, I hope to at least, you know, develop a few more of them. Okay. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much for your space. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve.